This is a tale that comes from about 1300 AD. There was a temple in Nara prefecture called Kankoji, where lived a monk named Dutu. Dutu had come from Koma province, modern day of northern Chosen Peninsula, and was a very tender-hearted and compassionate person. He noted one day that travelers had difficulty crossing the Uji River due to lack of a bridge, and so he supplied the funds from his personal savings to build a bridge for everyone's use. Acts such as this earned Dutu the respect and honor of everyone who knew him. One day, Dutu was walking through the valley of Mount Nara with his disciple Manrio. Quite by accident while glancing on the wayside, he saw a skull that had tumbled down from somewhere. The skull seemed to have had a hard time, being covered in mud and looking like it had been kicked around by travelers on the road. There was very little meat left clinging to the bone, and then only in small places. Dutu felt very sorry for the poor skull, and turned around to talk to his disciple Manrio, look at this poor skull, of nobody knows who. People have been picking on it even when it is dead. In order to protect it from this shameless behavior, the least we can do is place it in some tree away from trampling feet. As his master commanded, Manrio took the skull high up into a tree away from where it would be seen, and covered it with some branches to keep it hidden. This happened on the evening of the closing of the year. Soon after, a man appeared before the gates of Kanko-ji, asking to be shown inside. I have humbly come down from the mountains, with a request to see the one they call Manrio with my own eyes. Could you please bring me before him? The man was infallibly polite in his greeting and manners, so the young man tending the gate guided him to Manrio. Though Manrio had never seen the man before, his face had an odd familiarity about it. This is what the man said. I am a man who is deeply indebted to you. You have done me a tremendous service, and now I would like to return your generosity. Although I have brought nothing with me now, I beg of you to return with me to my home so that I may properly repay you. For his part, Manrio did not understand at all. However, because the petitioner had come with such heartfelt enthusiasm, he felt that the man must be telling the truth. How could I deny such a request from one so earnest? I will come with you to your home. There was nothing for Manrio to do except for to accompany the man out of the temple gates. When he arrived at the man's house, Manrio was presented with a dazzling feast. Please, please, take only your favorites, and lots of them. Please. While saying this, the man began to enthusiastically gorge himself. Manrio still wondered what he had done to deserve such rich rewards. But when he asked the man how exactly he had been of service, the man was quick to shut Manrio up by shoving delicious delicacies at him. There seemed to be no end to the offered morsels. Manrio, still a young man and given to worldly pleasures, was unable to resist. All right, I will hear the reason later. For now, I will simply enjoy the proffered feast. With that decided, Manrio dug into the food with as much enthusiasm as his mysterious companion. Never in his life had he tasted such delicious foods, and he was eager to try them all. Between the two of them, empty plates piled up like a mountain. Eventually, enthusiasm gave way to physics as Manrio could stuff no more food into his eager body. Thinking to relax, he was startled as he saw the man's face suddenly turn a violent shade. Honored Manrio, my brother who murdered me has just arrived. There is no time to hesitate. We must flee from here. Come with me. Hearing this, Manrio was shocked out of his pleasant repose. What? What exactly are you saying? His voice trembling, the man answered. Many years ago my brother and I had a business together. From that business I was able to save 30 kin of gold, about 18 kilograms. My brother himself saved nothing and thought it easier to kill me one night and steal my 30 kin of gold. For the longest time my body rotted in the forest, until nothing was left of me but my skull. People walking along the road who saw me would only kick my skull out of the way like an inconvenience. It was terrible. But then, beyond all hope you came along and lifted me up from the dirt and saved me from my fate. I thought about how I could possibly repay such a kindness, and so I came to your temple this evening to invite you to my house for this feast. To say that Manrio was surprised by this confession would be a gross understatement. But even in his panic and confusion he realized that being caught in this house by the murderous brother was undesirable, and so he jumped to his feet. But he was too slow in trying to escape, and he heard the door creak open and someone enter the house. The shock was too much for him, and Manrio froze in fright. The person at the door, however, was not the feared brother but instead the brother's son accompanied by their mother. She saw Manrio standing rigidly in her living room and shouted in fear. Ah! A monk! Why are you here inside my house? Manrio let the story he had just heard pour out in every detail. He turned back to look over his shoulder and get confirmation from the man who had led him to this house, only to see nothing. The mother listened to Manrio's story with as much shock as Manrio had. It was nothing like what she had heard before. 
The mother was very angry towards her son who had killed his younger brother. She looked down at the brother's son and told him in her strictest voice, Your father is a terrible person. You must pray for the spirit of your murdered uncle and apologize for your father's crime. The young boy did as he was directed and removed his father from his heart to be replaced by honored instead his uncle who had been good and kind. I bought a new house in the small town of Winthrop. The house was cheap, but the most important part was that I needed to get away from the city. A few months ago, I had a run-in with a stalker. While I had managed to get him arrested, I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes just constantly watching me. I felt like there were eyes everywhere, at home and on the street, so I decided to move out into the country to somewhere with less people, just for peace of mind. The house itself was big and somewhat old, but otherwise very welcoming. The agent who introduced me to the house had been required to mention that a serial killer had lived here in the past, which was why the house was so cheap. However, he and later, my next door neighbor Sarah, both told me to pay the thought no mind. Four other owners had lived in the house since then, and all of them were very happy with it. I loved the house. Its interior furnishings were beautiful and very comfortable. The people of Winthrop were friendly, often bringing over freshly baked pastries or inviting me over for dinner. Get-togethers, they said, were the key to making sure everyone who lived in Winthrop loved it there. Yet after a week, I stopped loving it. The feeling of someone watching returned, worse than before. I tried to ignore it, but soon I started losing sleep. Giant bags grew under my eyes and I began yawning almost as much as I breathed. Sarah was kind enough to let me stay in her house for a few nights. It was during this time that I heard the legend of Forrest Carter, the serial killer who had lived in my house. While no one knows his exact kill count, Carter, also known as the Winthrop Peacock, was a man with extremely severe case of narcissism. Legends say that he couldn't fall asleep if he didn't feel like he was being watched. He was finally arrested for putting up a scarecrow to watch him during the night. Only it wasn't a scarecrow. Carter had murdered a 17-year-old girl, just so her corpse could stare at him. The story gave me shivers, and after I went home I felt like there were hundreds of pairs of eyes just watching me no matter how I turned. Today, however, was the first day that I acted out. I was cooking breakfast, when I felt the eyes. Instinctively, out of fear, I threw my kitchen knife, which lodged itself into the wall. As I pulled it out, I found myself staring at a pair of eyes, pickling in formaldehyde. I've been watching the police peel away the drywall of my house for hours now. So far, they've found 142 pairs of eyes in little glass jars. The scariest thing is, each and every one was staring at me.